Okay, uh, well, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. So we will speak in uh, English uh, uh, as a result of being a visiting professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm again very thankful uh, to uh, Manuel Roman and the Center for Latin American Studies uh, for allowing, for doing this uh, transmission uh, via uh, Zoom and in times of the coronavirus. No, I'm very happy that we can have such a presentation, such a discussion, and that uh, academic life can uh, fortunately and hopefully continue in the next weeks uh, and months. No, uh, I have a we agreed on a presentation of around 30 to 45 minutes, uh, and my presentation will cover these uh, five topics. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the goal of the presentation is to, to, to present this annual effort we have been doing of the Monitor of China's Overseas Foreign Direct Investment, OFDI, in Latin America uh, for 2020. You know? And to cover uh, these, again, topics that I hope you will find useful, uh, you might have the presentation uh, uploaded in the uh, uh, web page of the center, uh, but also of Sechimex and Reda LS China. I remind you very briefly, uh, this effort is a result of the work we have been doing at the Academic Network for Latin America and the Caribbean on China, Reda LS China. Uh, this institution is an academic, proudly an academic initiative since 2012. Uh, the uh, Red has two important pillars. Uh, one is the union of uh, Latin American and Caribbean universities, or UDUAL, and the other is the Center for Chinese-Mexican Studies of the School of Economics of UNAM. Uh, the idea of this uh, institution, of this academic network, is to socialize a, in a public and free a way the research results on Latin America uh, and China, its relationship from an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary perspective together with the public, private, uh, and academic sectors from a very heterogeneous perspective. The network has been growing in the last year substantially. We have more than 600 members today from all over the world and the group of institutions that are participating. I invite you again to participate in the network. You will find lots of statistics, books in English, uh, in Spanish, hopefully soon also even in Chinese, if you want to improve your Chinese or your Spanish or your English. Uh, and again, what we are attempting to do since 2012 is to improve the quality of the understanding of China, particularly from a, China, from a Latin American perspective. But to be honest, we have increasingly also the participation of Chinese and US analysis. And so we are having a very vivid dialogue and debate on some of these topics. We have had a group of documents on a, on a variety of issues that I'm simply highlighting uh, in the presentation. Uh, uh, I remind you the, the, the network is divided in four areas, thematic areas. One is economy, international relations, environment and history, uh, cultural issues and, and learning Chinese and Spanish. Uh, and again, we have had almost 30 publications in the last years. One of the, the important and interesting topics that I would invite you uh, is that as a result of this ongoing work at Sechimex, at the academic network, is that we have been trying to distinguish and differentiate the different topics and to structure the analysis in this increasing relationship between Latin America and China. This is to differentiate between trade, which has been increasingly important uh, since the 1990s. Today, China is the second major part trading partner uh, of Latin America, the first of 
countries such as Brazil, Argentina, uh, uh, Peru, Chile, among others. Then we have to differentiate in, with the topic of financing, which is completely different than trade. The third topic that will be the focus of the presentation of today is overseas foreign direct investment, which means the outflows of foreign FDI from China to Latin America. And finally, infrastructure projects, which is probably the most sophisticated uh, uh, effort of China in Latin America and in the world, not only in Latin America, also in Africa and Asia and in other parts of the world. We have to differentiate these topics in much of the literature in Latin America, in China, in the US, we very surprisingly find a mixture of these topics and analysis, uh, which leads us to a lot of misunderstandings and to a lack of integrating to the specificities and proposals uh, that already exist. No? Uh, and on the topic of overseas foreign direct investment, I again invite you to the efforts that uh, the network and Sechimex have been doing at least for five, if not 10 years. This is a group of analysis at the macro level, meso level, micro level, case studies, regional issues, etc., cetera, uh, where we have been working again for a longer period of time. The topic of today then, after this long presentation, if you want to, is to present the results of this monitor of Chinese of the, in Latin America and the Caribbean for 2020. Uh, you will find all the documents, which is, uh, not, which is one document, written and translated into Chinese and into English. You can download them from the webpage uh, of the monitor uh, since a few days ago. No? Uh, I remind you the goal of this monitor is not only to present statistics, but to allow for a dialogue and to allow for an for a broader understanding on the specific topic of Chinese investments in Latin America uh, with uh, or integrating uh, the, the existing research in the respective Latin American countries from Argentina to Mexico, but including also results from research institutions, of course, in China, in the United States and other places. So yes, there is an important focus, if you want to, on statistics and with important results, but you will also find news, policy proposals, hundreds of documents uh, from uh, the public, private, and academic sector. No? I have to highlight also that this monitor is a result of the support of a group of colleagues, particularly of students and assistants that have been working on this topic and have allowed for the results that I will present to you. And finally, the goal of this uh, monitor of China's of the Latin America is to allow for a more dedicated, committed, detailed discussion on the topic. While the Latin America-China relationship is increasingly fashionable in Latin America, in China, in the United States also, it is very surprising that uh, this integration of the and understanding of the results in Latin America, in the US, in China, in general is very weak, uh, ve with a very acidly, if you want to. I have commented on this discussion sometimes of uh, uh, with authors and institutions that are highly autistic, no? which, uh, and with all due respect, to autism, no? which means a, a lot of authors and institutions are, are practically discovering topics and not integrating to the ongoing discussions and debates in the respective countries. Uh, again, all the information is publicly available. I invite you to see the results and to go into the net uh, and web page of the monitor and the academic uh, uh, of the academic network. 
No? The structure of the document, it's a very brief document. What we try to be is to be as executive as possible to allow for generating interest on this topic. So the, the document has 10 to 12 pages, no? depending on the translation. And this is the structure of the document. There is a regional and international context of Chinese of the in Latin America, a group of trends regarding specifically total Chinese of the beyond Latin America, and then a group of very concrete results regarding China's of the in the region. No? Regarding the first topic, the international and regional context, I remind you on what we uh, analyze in the document is that a foreign direct investment in general and in 2019 has been affected by low uh, GDP growth in 2019 uh, and not integrating yet the results of the coronavirus uh, impact. According to UNCTAD in 2020, the impact could result of the coronavirus uh, emergency could result in a fall of, uh, of worldwide FDI from of around minus 15%. So again, this is not included uh, in what will happen in 2020. In Latin America, however, and surprisingly, inflows of FDI have increased by almost 16%, according again to uh, UNTA, to around 170 billions. And surprisingly, uh, uh, the United States and China are both important recipients of, in, of investments, uh, and uh, the flows have remained relatively uh, constant. No. Uh, interestingly, and the topic that could be discussed in much more detail, uh, and that has been surprisingly, even in the academic sector, not been analyzed sufficiently, is the effect of the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act in the United States. And there is a result of this new law in the United States, uh, the in 2018, and particularly in 2019, the net outflows of foreign direct investment of, of, the, of the United States has been negative for the first time since the U.S. have statistics. This is big corporations, transnational corporations in the U.S. are repatriating capital to the U.S. as a result of the incentives of this uh, Jobs Act, no? a topic that will be relevant for the next years. Uh, so again, what, was, what I was mentioning was this, far, this, first, uh, this first part of the international and regional context. Uh, and some interesting overall uh, international and regional trends regarding foreign direct investment. Specifically regarding Latin America, uh, it is interesting to, to see that Brazil has been in 2019 the most important country and dynamic country in receiving FDI. Uh, Lat in Latin America, surprisingly, particularly new investments or what technically is called greenfield projects have been growing substantially against merger and acquisition processes. Uh, I would link the, 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 this presentation and the monitor of 2020 to former research results uh, regarding the importance of China's of the in Latin America in the generation of employment, as we will see in a moment. No? Last year we published a book, big uh, document regarding four case studies of how China has been generating employment in Latin America in four countries, and one of the most dynamic variables is exactly overseas foreign direct investment. Two additional topics, the legislation regarding the legal 
uh, and, uh, issues for enhancing Chinese overseas foreign direct investment has not changed in, the, in, in 2019 and is similar to 2016, 2017. And finally, there are a group of debates, as most of us are aware, there are a group of debates on a social and environmental footprint of Chinese of the in Latin America. Uh, in the document, you, you find a group of uh, references uh, to this discussion, local, national, regional, Latin America, regarding this footprint. No? Methodologically, I remind you, it is very important to remember that the monitor takes very seriously and integrates, incorporates uh, the proposals, the methodological and statistical proposals of the institutions that work on foreign direct investment, concretely such as the OECD, UNCTAD, the Ministry of Commerce of China, and of course the national sources in Latin America from Argentina uh, to Mexico. The big contribution, if you want to, of the monitor of Chinese foreign direct investment is that we work a, at the transaction level. This is transaction by transaction from Argentina to Mexico. We work with all these different statistical uh, and information sources uh, and review transaction by transaction uh, and add up to a group of a, a, a results as we will see a, in a moment. A, some of you know, if you want to, my obsession regarding the understanding of methodologies from trade to infrastructure, in this case regarding foreign direct investment. Statistics and methodologies matter a lot, no? Otherwise we will not understand respective uh, sources and the results. No? I mentioned here, for example, as a result of the more detailed work we did in 2019 in the monitor, that for example, for the period 2010-2015, the differences between MOFCOM and the results that we achieved for the period 2010-2015 are dramatic. So. Uh, the monitor accounts for 100% and MOFCOM accounts for 13.65%. Uh, this is very substantial. If we do not understand what we are using, what we are quoting, we will end up using statistics with 100% or 14%. Uh, the information is public. You can download the information transaction by transaction. We have been doing this again together with students, with a group of researchers in Argentina, in Brazil, in Uruguay, in Peru, in Mexico, and based on a group of original sources that you can see uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. By the way, many, if not all of them, of these original sources have very serious quality problems. No? In the case of the China Global Investment Tracker, for example, you will find one statistical database that A, mix up uh, infrastructure projects and foreign direct investments. As I mentioned in one of my former slides, this is not the same. Inf an infrastructure project is a service. It doesn't have anything to do with investment. So you have one of the sources or several of the sources that use, that include apples and pears. And in addition, many of the transactions that are registered in most of these uh, original sources are announcements of foreign direct investments. No? So you still have uh, transactions from three, four, five, ten years ago that have never been realized. No? So again, in that uh, sense, I would highlight that the contribution of the monitor is interesting. The final result of visit uh, uh, analyzing hundreds of transactions based on these original sources and based on the network that we have 
but of researchers, of business institutions, etc. The result is 435 transactions of Chinese foreign direct investment uh, for the period 2000-2019 and with a group of columns, no? including the amount of foreign direct investment, the employment, the date, and the group of specificities regarding uh, uh, these transactions that, again, I invite you to use for additional research. Again, I am very sure that we have problems, like some of these uh, uh, big institutions with, with uh, their resources, but I am very sure that it is an interesting and important contribution. What are some of the results? And uh, I have a few uh, minutes left. I, I'm doing pretty well with the time. So what are some of the results of, of the uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly, in 2019, China's overseas foreign direct investment total, not only to Latin America, but to the world, fell by almost 10%. Now we're speaking of almost 120 billion US dollars. And by the way, this is substantially lower than the highest level the Chinese of the reached in 2016. Uh, uh, again, so it is important that not all economic variables from China will grow exponentially. China's overseas foreign direct investment is a good example. No? The relationship, the quota or the ratio of, of, of China's total of the over FDI, which means China is a uh, exporting capital, but it is also importing capital, this ratio uh, uh, accounted for 85%. I remind you, in some years, in the last two or three years, this ratio was above 100%. What does this mean? That China was, uh, China had higher levels of, cap of, of, FD, of foreign direct investment outflows, than inflows. No? This has been changing uh, uh, importantly in the last years. And by the way, China in 2019 became the second major source of capital outflows. The first one was Japan, the second one was uh, China. And as I mentioned to you, as a, re uh, uh, as a result of this Jobs Act in the United States, the United States in 2019 had a, an outflow of, capital, of foreign direct investment that was negative. This is very, a very interesting result. Sp specifically for 2019, uh, Chinese of the to Latin America only registered 19 transactions. Some of you might say, oh, you did all this uh, work and this effort to end up with 19 transactions. Again, reviewing hundreds of transactions and seeing if these were, re were realized, if the amounts, if the employment, if the dates, et cetera, are correct, et cetera. And these 19 transactions accounted for almost 30 billion US dollars uh, in 2019. And there is a growth rate for the first time since 2019 of 16.5%. This is an interesting trend, again, specifically for 2019. By the way, the employment generated by China's of the in 2019 fell by 43%. No? Uh, and by the way, in, another interesting trend for 2019 is that most of China's of the concentrated in merger and acquisition transactions. 65%, almost two thirds of Chinese of the concentrated in mergers and acquisitions and more than 86% of the employment generated. A group of particular results that I invite you to, to look in more detail to the data that is publicly uh, accessible. First of all, uh, again, this long-term trend of uh, China's of the focusing on 
uh, or not focusing, but uh, uh, being realized in merger and acquisition transactions, a new overseas foreign direct investment or greenfield transactions. So, so you see very clearly this more recent trend in 2019 in contrast to 2017 and 2018. We could dedicate a long time only to this slide. Again, interesting new patterns regarding China's foreign direct investment that again recovered in 2019 with a growth rate of 16.5%. A second topic, uh, and I will uh, refer to some general conclusions based on these trends. A second important topic is uh, how China's of the in Latin America has very substantially diversified in the last years. Uh, this is very important because I have the impression that in the public sector, in the academic sector, in the business sector, uh, in Latin America, in China, in the United States, a lot of the analysis uh, are still uh, in some cases at least five years behind the results regarding Chinese offer in Latin America. A lot of the analysis still highlight topics that, as we will see, have been changing in the last years. One of these topics regarding China's diversification in terms of OFDI is that while historically China's OFDI highly concentrated in Argentina and in Brazil, historical, you will see in the presentation in the two first columns the importance of Argentina and particularly Brazil in terms of the amount of FD, of, of the, but also of the employment generated. In the last two or three years, Chile, Peru and Mexico have been increasingly important, no? Particularly in 2019, uh, Peru received almost 5 billion US dollars of Chinese foreign direct investment. And Chile, by the way, in 2018 and 2019 has become very important, a very important receptor or host of China's foreign direct investment. I invite you to see, as the, on the contrary, the a very substantial fall regarding the uh, hosting of, of the I transactions by Argentina and particularly Brazil. This has to do with national particularities, problems in, in the respective countries, but I believe also with new patterns and characteristics of China's uh, of the in Latin America. Again, you will see each transaction. You can find all this data a much more sophisticated, presented in a much more sophisticated, sophisticated way uh, in, the, uh, in the monitor. And by the way, you can uh, uh, understand all this information if you get into the web page. An additional uh, interesting topic and again, regarding the increasing diversification of China's of the in Latin America, is that the, that the sectors in which China's of the has been uh, concentrating in the last years have diversified importantly. It is historically correct that by far the most important sector uh, in which OFDI was realized in Latin America, if you see the column it for, for, or the line for 2010-2019, around 60% of China's uh, OFDI in Latin America, 2000-2019, concentrated in raw materials. But look, in 2016, 2017, 2018, how this has been changing, not in 2019, which means the manufacturing sector, particularly highly export-oriented in auto parts, automobiles, electronics, but also the service sector, oriented towards the domestic sector in 
but in the banking sectors and other services is increasingly important. This is again an invitation to many colleagues, friends, public and private sector, an invitation to understand the increasing diversification and complexity of China in Latin America, particularly regarding Chinese OFDI in the region, and to allow for a more complex analysis beyond raw materials uh, of uh, China in Latin America. Two final topics that I would like to share with you. Uh, one, uh, also regarding this increasing diversification, as you know, uh, the academic network and myself, we have been working on this concept of the omnipresence of the public sector in China, and which is very relevant for understanding Chinese uh, uh, of the in the region. For the full period 2000-2019, uh, the Chinese OFDI in terms of the amount, around 75% of China's OFDI was uh, uh, realized by firms of China's public sector. This is a very important topic that we have to understand much more in detail in Latin America for enhancing Chinese OFDI, FDI, etc. But in the last years, see the graph for, the, uh, for 2015, 2016, and particularly 17 and 18, there has been an increasing diversification, which means the private sector as the source of Chinese FDI is playing an increasingly important role. This is not the case for 2019. Here again, the public sector uh, has a share of almost 87% uh, of, ch of China's total of the, for the period. Again, here I invite you to see this, this inf uh, information by country, for the region, by transactions, etc. Finally, and again, I would say to uh, colleagues in Latin America, in China, and the United States, the monitor for China and Latin America, uh, the, of Chinese of the Latin America, is an invitation, an open invitation to do firm level analysis. No? Uh, the two last uh, sections of uh, the monitor highlight that based on the data set that is publicly available, we can specify our analysis on a group of very concrete firms, Chinese firms that are doing investment in Latin America. If we take the whole period 2000 to 2019, for example, and try to highlight which are the most important Chinese firms that are generating employment. We could we do exactly the same by overseas foreign direct investment or all the other variables that you will find in the data set that you can download. We will find that a group of firms such as China National Petroleum Corporation, State Grid, and others are playing a very important and substantial role in the generation of a Chinese of employment of Chinese of the in Latin America. This is a fantastic invitation again to see firm by firm labor issues, uh, topics regarding rules, uh, successful and failures regarding the relations, understanding, etc., etc. No? Conclusions, and I'm practically finishing uh, regarding uh, the, the monitor. Uh, one, on the one hand, I would highlight the importance uh, of integrating to the existing analysis on China's of the in Latin America, by the way, also in China and in the United States. While we should improve and deepen, deepen the analysis on China's OFDI, it is surprisingly how much 
we have achieved regarding the understanding of China's offering in Latin America from a macro, meso, micro, and territorial perspective. And of course, in all these an analysis, you will see policy proposals uh, on, on this issue. Again, and I'm very clear on this topic, it is very surprising to see how a group of think tanks, for example, uh, in Washington, D.C., they simply do not beat a lot of of Latin America, from Argentina, in Brazil, in Uruguay, Peru, and Mexico, and of course, in China, and they reinvent the wheel for the tenth time again and do not improve the already existing uh, results. I could only highlight the importance, and you will see in the webpage of, uh, of, of the monitor, a, a group of very specific analysis that we have also translated into Spanish, Chinese, and English regarding statistics and methodologies that different institutions use. We very strongly highlight that these institutions are not lying, but what they are doing is they are using different methodologies. And as researchers, as public sector, as private sector, we have to understand the benefits and the shortcomings of the respective methodologies. No? So, uh, an important, uh, very general conclusion we can, as you imagine, do very specific conclusions for Central America, for Peru, for Mexico, for Argentina, and for Brazil, and each of the Latin American countries. But the regional conclusion regarding China's of the in Latin America is the Chinese of the has increasingly diversified in the region by ownership, by sector, by country. Uh, and the old story that the only thing that China's of the is looking for in Latin America is cheap raw materials. Uh, unfortunately, this is empirically not true. Welcome to a much more updated information and discussion uh, based on existing results. No? Uh, I remind you here on this topic last year, uh, Reda LSE, published a document of more, of more than 400 pages, 15 chapters regarding China's OFLI in Latin America with countries, uh, institutions, and uh, 16, 17 authors. A final conclusion is that probably, and at least more from my perspective, that the future research should not only deepen and improve some of this uh, information uh, regarding statistics, methodologies, etc. But I find it particularly interesting to uh, focus on specific global value chains, from soya beans to minerals and some of the global value chains I highlight in the in the PowerPoint presentation, uh, and focusing exclusively on the topic of overseas foreign direct investment from China uh, to Latin America. I think this is a huge and very interesting field of research where very little has been done. Again, I'm not saying that nothing has been done, but in general, very little uh, in, in the context of this existing information. I highlight finally simply uh, that it is important to improve the quality of the analysis of China's of the in Latin America, by the way, also in other fields of research and knowledge of China and Latin America, you can download all the, uh, uh, the annual results as a document of 10 to 12 pages of the monitor in Chinese, English, and Spanish in the, um, in the web page of the monitor. And by the way, I finally, maybe I should have begun or started with this, thanking, of course, a, a group of students and researchers such as Luis Humberto, Raimundo, Leide, and, and Luis Fernando, who have done a tremendous work in uh, researching each of the hundreds of transactions in the last months. So thank you very much. 
welcome to this discussion and to this debate. Uh, and if you have qu questions, please do not hesitate to write us to uh, the webpage and the email of the monitor of or Red ILSH. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Um, I, we've um, gotten quite a few uh, comments on the on the Zoom group chat. I have not been monitoring the Facebook transmission, um, and perhaps Jessica can help us with that. I, I'm wondering if you, uh, if anyone has questions that they might want to uh, send to you um, for for further discussion. Good morning, Professor Dusen. Hello. I have a question. Okay. Go, okay. Marilu. Okay. Uh, Professor Dusen, did you find some evidence of any foreign direct investment in Latin America that is related to the health sector? To the health sector? Yes. Right. No, so far it's not a very uh, important uh, sector for Chinese overseas foreign direct investment. No? Uh, however, it would be probably a very in interesting research topic, uh, considering again that China is increasingly investing in this domestically oriented service sector in the region beyond raw materials, and it is probable that you will find a group of transactions uh, in Latin America, depending on the respective country, in Peru, in Jamaica, uh, or in Mexico. No, but in general, I would tell you, as a sector, as an economic active, socio-economic activity, uh, health so far has not been an important sector. No? Thank you. Yeah, you are welcome, Marilu. I will remind everyone um, uh, on the Zoom group chat, uh, you have links to the report in all three of the versions, whether it's English, Spanish, or Chinese. Uh, and then we've also requested uh, just to better understand the reach of the event, as this is, you know, these are the early days in our, in our forays into virtual uh, meetings of this sort. Um, if you would kindly um, send a, a brief line as to where you are located um, when, as you participate in this event. Um. Well, also, uh, yes. Oh, the Francisco. Yes. <clears throat> well, good morning and thank you for the excellent uh, conference. I would like to ask to Professor Dossel, um, if you see any dramatic change in the direction of overseas foreign direct investment uh, due to the coronavirus, are we expecting big changes in, in investments in Latin America? You have a very beautiful background. I envy you very <laughs> much. <laughs> You have to tell me later where you get such a fantastic background. <laughs> I don't have it, as you see. It. <laughs> uh, look, uh, yes, everything uh, leads to the conclusion that 2020 will be a very dramatic year in terms of GDP, employment, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the Treasury uh, uh, in the United States is, has been discussing that, we, that they might have a 20% unemployment rate in the United States. Uh, first results regarding the impact of the coronavirus in China leads to the conclusion that in the first quarter of 2020, GDP in China might fell uh, by around minus six to minus 10%. This is very dramatic. We'll see what happens in 2020 for the full year. Uh, and so, yes, Chinese overseas foreign direct investment, which is highly linked to GDP of China and the respective countries, will very po probably Fall, sub, fell substantially in 2020. No? Uh, by how much, we will have to see it, but I would uh, 
very strongly prepare us to find in 2020 a, a, a scenario in which Chinese OFTI will fall uh, very dramatically. Again, we will see differences by countries. And I would say, and just to finish, but the, the, the invitation, if you want to, of the monitor is to allow for a deeper understanding of China's of the, and so that the public sector is able to understand details of China's of the, by, by country, by firm, by sector, etc., and that we develop a better understanding for enhancing China's overseas foreign direct investment. What we have not been doing is to, un to, to enhance particular instruments in the ministries or secretaries of economy in our Latin American countries. And so beyond the coronavirus, I think there is a huge potential from Uruguay to Peru to Jamaica to Mexico of increasing China's of the, but only if we understand the specificities of China's of the in the last years. And this is where some of the research of the academic network might be interesting at the micro, meso, macro level, including the, the legal network and understanding of China's of the. You know? In that respect, um, <clears throat> I wanted to follow up a bit on, on Francisco's question. Um, you know, I, I know you, you don't like to speculate much and you don't have a crystal ball, but um, you know, to the extent uh, beyond the, uh, you know, what you've just shared, um, do you see that not only from China's side, uh, the capacity to execute uh, this direct investment in in the Latin American countries may also come into play. Uh, in other words, not just from the supply, but also the demand side. Mm. Look, I, I would say in general that in Latin America we have an important demand for investments. Uh, again, uh, wh while in trade, uh, China's a presence in Latin America has been very important, probably also regarding infrastructure projects in the specific topic of uh, foreign direct investment in Latin America. The presence of China has been so far secondary if you compare it to the United States and to the European Union uh, as a whole. No? But I would say that America has an enormous demand for for investments in general, also for foreign direct investments, and also coming from China. No? China has a huge expertise, as other countries do, uh, in specific sectors. No? Uh, someone was asking regarding the health sector. It would be interesting to see uh, if China has the ability to invest and to transmit and transfer some of the uh, very important achievements of China uh, in hospitals, <laughs> in the crisis of the coronavirus uh, in, in, in the last weeks and months. And if China is able to transfer some of these capacities in terms of foreign direct investment uh, to Latin America. But by the way, also regarding other specific uh, segments of value added chains uh, from electricity to auto parts, automobiles, and many others, as I uh, highlighted at the end of my presentation. No? Uh, so yes, I think there is a huge demand. The problem is that in many countries of Latin America, uh, particularly of elites in Latin America, our understanding of China in general, and specifically regarding the topic of uh, of, of the coming from China, our knowledge is very weak. It's full of racism, full of uh, topics from China 
of outdated uh, uh, understandings of China. Uh, and this, of course, does not improve, to put it politely, it does not improve the possibility of enhancing uh, Chinese of the in Latin America. I would even set up the thesis, the hypothesis, if you want to, a top that could be discussed more in depth in the future, that probably most of China's of the in Latin America is a result, is a result uh, of Chinese efforts, more a supply side, if you want to, a uh, flow of of the to Latin America. And I encounter very few concrete uh, 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 strategies in Latin America regarding uh, the switch of a specific uh, projects, no clusters, if you want to special economic zones and whatever, in Latin America that search for China's of the, no. Uh, so uh, the effort seems to be more from the Chinese than from the Latin American side, and apparently Latin America is more of a spectator, no, than of an active actor <laughs> uh, searching for Chinese of the here, the potential, I humbly believe, is enormous. No? Okay, so everything everything was very clear. <laughs> hey, Dr. Dussel, could I possibly have a second question? Yes. Thank you much. Uh, Which I is the future of the New Silk Road, the Bellen Road? is again what may be the impact of all this um, situation related to the coronavirus how do you perceive it may be the the impact on the uh, Belt and road a uh, project in the coming probably two three years look this is not a specific uh, topic that we analyze in the monitor or in the context of a, or in the or in the general context no this is of china's of the and belt and road initiative a, we mentioned it in the document, it is impossible to discuss China today in 2020, not explicitly integrating whatever China is doing globally, if you do not mention and understand the Belt and Road Initiative. No, uh, I remind you, and personally, if you visit the webpage of RED, but also my own personal webpage, I remind you, we have been discussing this topic of China uh, presenting a globalization process with Chinese characteristics in which the Belt and Road Initiative is the main instrument, an umbrella if you want to, uh, <coughs> regarding the different activities, initiatives, policies, uh, white books, papers, etc., that China has been developing. No? And from this perspective, overseas foreign direct investment plays an important role. But again, it's not only overseas foreign direct investment, but also trade, financing, uh, infrastructure projects. And China has been developing a group of very particular institutions, initiatives. The Selak China Forum, for example, plays a very important role in this global understanding of a Chinese of a globalization process with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and again, uh, of the uh, plays an important role in this particular uh, 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 initiative. No? However, very unfortunately, again, I believe that Latin America, Latin American countries, single, separately, but as a region, we have not been able to understand the different initiatives by China. No, We have not taken sufficiently seriously the proposal of China vis-a-vis -vis Latin America. Again, you might agree or disagree with the proposal of China concretely, for example, in the Select China Forum, but Latin America as a region, in there specifically, been very slow 
to understand very specific proposals regarding investment, trade, infrastructure, and dozens of other proposals. We have been very slow, and we have been we have been, we have, we have uh, uh, simply not been able to respond to China's strategy vis-à-vis -vis Latin America. No? We are saying, uh, "I will call you back tomorrow." No, te llamo mañana, uh, and and. <laughs> mañana and the day after tomorrow and years flow no and very little happens no this is very unfortunate and well at the, at the dread said she makes together with the university of pittsburgh and many others who are trying to allow for a more detailed and a more concrete strategy at the regional level at the national level to understand these very concrete proposals of china vis-a-vis Latin America. Again, the, the, the response of a particular country can be, no, I do not want to make use of these instruments. That's fine. No, but China promised in, to the CELAC and China Forum a 400 a master's degree a, a, a programs to students a, and in the, in the, in, in the in light of this CELAC China Forum, and none of the Latin American countries make use of that. No? So I would say, okay, if Uruguay does not want to do it because they have ideological problems with China, then let's Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis, or Guatemala, if they had <laughs> diplomatic <laughs> relations, or whoever, let them take the opportunity of having not all 400 master's degree programs, but 50, with 50 engineers from Uruguay to Brazil, uh, or in, in Uruguay, to, uh, in China, on meat processing, you change the whole marketing and supply structure in Uruguay. Thank you much. Uh, starting with uh, Devenko's question, um, uh, he, um, uh, and so and the last topic that you mentioned uh, of successfully attracting Chinese investment, what are the examples of countries' policies that were successfully attracting it? Mm. Uh, well, uh, again, in general, I would highlight uh, we find uh, few cases uh, where Latin America has been able to attract uh, foreign direct investment. No? Uh, based on the question uh, you made, Manuel, uh, a moment ago, uh, again, apparently most of the uh, efforts in Latin America by the respective countries, again, as a demand from a, as a demand-driven enhancement of China's of the in Latin America. In general, this has not been very successful. Probably one of the most interesting cases are for countries such as I would say, particularly Ecuador and Bolivia where there has been a concrete effort in attracting overseas foreign direct investment in specific sectors. But again, also, even in these cases, you will find a, a discussions on a problems regarding the effectivity of these of this instruments in the region. No? Okay. And then we have a question from STS. Uh, that's all I have for the name. Uh, and, and it says, thanks a lot, Dr. Dussel, for that initiative. Watching from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I have a question, but my microphone, unfortunately, is broken. So uh, the question is here. Oh, you're back. You're back. Okay, great. Yes, thanks to okay. our friends of Telefono de Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the, the, the question um, is actually, uh, the last years, considering the data presented, 
few contracts, less participation of public enterprises, more towards Chile and Peru, and less towards the raw material industries. What does it mean in general? Most toward infrastructure? Again, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the, your uh, question. Again, uh, this is overseas foreign direct investment. This is not infrastructure. Infrastructure projects are different. I remind you, and I invite you again to see some of the very specific uh, uh, methodological discussions uh, in the last years. An infrastructure project is a service, which means a, usually a public institution in Latin America requests for an infrastructure project. It can be a Wi-Fi network, it can be an airport, it can be a hospital, no? And usually this is a public bidding. It can be full of corruption and whatever. It happens all over the world. And I would tell you, uh, uh, and after three months, six months, or three years, or five years, you finish the project, uh, the Chinese firms or the German or US or Japanese firm gets paid uh, and the client, in this case, usually the public sector in Latin America, gets the project. And they, this is not an investment. No? Uh, so uh, uh, what does this mean? That again, we have a growth in terms of the value of China's off the in 2019, but the fall in employment. Well, what it means is that specifically in 2019, uh, the the infra the of the projects of uh, of China and Latin America are huge a merger and acquisition projects, only 19 transactions. And again, uh, I would say a very interesting discussion in which China is going far beyond raw materials. China is consolidating in activities, in investment activities regarding uh, the domestic market in Latin America, Chinese firms are learning in Latin America uh, in their respective countries. And again, an increasing activity also in another field and another sector, which is manufacturing. No? So uh, China is investing in electronics, auto parts, automobiles, telecommunications. A very important firm here is Huawei. We have done look at the uh, web page of the of the academic network you will find a research of Huawei in Mexico, Huawei in Argentina and by the way Huawei is in Ecuador, Brazil uh, and wherever you go to. No? So this uh, is a process of increasing diversification and an increasing complexity of the relationship between Latin America and China. The old results were the only thing that China wants to do is conquer Latin America and extract raw materials in China is humbly, I believe, not sufficient. The picture is getting complex increasingly complex uh, and this uh, uh, old novel that many people have painted in Latin America, in Washington and other places is unfortunately not true, specifically for the case of China's of the in Latin America. No, I don't. Yes, I would like you to comment on the U.S. effort to block Huawei equipment adoption in and its effect on Latin America and for 5G networks. Right. Yeah, I've been following quite a bit the, the, the discussion. Uh, hmm. How could I tell you? Again, this has a lot to do uh, with this concept that we have been developing uh, at, uh, at the academic network of new triangular relationships. This is old bilateral relationships, Guatemala with El Salvador, Brazil with Argentina, or Mexico with the United States or with Central America has been, at least in the last 10 years, 
profoundly changed by the increasing presence of China, no? which means in the Brazil-Argentina relationship, China is playing an important role in the Guatemala, El Salvador, or Mexico, a, a United States relationship, for example. No? And so what we're witnessing today is this big power competition between the United States and China, uh, and specifically regarding the leadership, leadership in terms of innovation and new technologies and telecommunications plays a very important role in China and specifically Huawei is having a, 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 a so we are witnessing these uh, tensions between the US and China, specifically regarding the technological uh, 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 leadership uh, and in the case of Huawei. And Latin America is the third country in this new triangular relationship, which so far has not been directly affected. No, uh, We have been working, and myself, very concretely regarding Huawei in Mexico. And Huawei in Mexico, I remind you, again, I invite you to look at the results of the work we have been doing. Around 80% of, of the wire wireless infrastructure uh, in Mexico today, the one I am using here, and is apparently not working very well, <laughs> <laughs> but 80% of the wireless infrastructure, independently if it is Telcel or Telefonica or AT&T, 80% is provided by Huawei. Huawei is in Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Cuba, Venezuela, and Mexico. Uh, so far, I think there are no other options today. No? If you want to connect via 5G, the only, if you compare it in terms of price and quality, option today is Huawei. No? Uh, but again, tensions are getting very, very tough. I invite you to go through some of the more recent documents and analysis we have been doing, uh, and it can get a, a lot more difficult, also in the context of the current coronavirus. No? Hi. Hi. Uh, hello, Professor Dusan. I just wanted to ask you about um, something that American companies do in Latin America and other world re global regions, which is like due diligence, they do compliance checks. And I'm just wondering if, like, if you know how Chinese companies account for risk factors like corruption, bribery, political instability when making investments. Mm -hmm. This is a fantastic question, no? and I, I would simply invite you, uh, as, as, a, as a polite invitation again, uh, to allow for a deeper understanding of Chinese films. No? This is, to be very honest, a big question mark for myself and for a group of researchers of Latin America, and where we have been trying to invite Chinese researchers to exactly respond to that question. How are Chinese firms, by the way, not only on OFTI, but also on infrastructure projects, how well prepared are these institutions? Now, if in my presentation and in the monitor, you see, for example, by the name, at the end I finish highlighting, for example, that China National Petroleum Corporation a corporation has created more than 23,000 jobs regarding only of not infrastructure projects. How well prepared is this firm in understanding the differences between Argentina and Mexico, I would say between Las Malvinas and Mexicali, or is Latin America an abstraction, as by the way it is for many Latin Americans regarding China? Do they have a specific unit for understanding the characteristics and differences between Ecuador, eh, 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 Nicaragua, and Mexico, or is all this or, or is this all the same? To be honest, I don't know. <laughs> we, uh, we have been able to analyze, understand, interview the Mexican, Argentinian, Brazilian, and Peruvian side 
of some Chinese firms, uh, and we expect that Chinese or maybe Latin American friends that live in China, but it is very difficult to understand uh, risks, no? Uh, and a, a, a concrete understanding of laws, of usos y costumbres, no? How do you work in the respective territories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My impression is that even this huge Chinese transnational corporations are not very well prepared. My impression is that the socialization of information, of experiences, of risks of Chinese firms in the region among themselves is very poor. And this is very surprising if you understand the other topic, which is a Chinese inflows of capital, not the outflows. Regarding the inflows, China, I believe that China has been very successful in generating a legal, a social, a political framework for learning, if you want to, for copying. But in the case of the outflows, Chinese firms are learning very slowly. Chinese firms are not doing their homework. Chinese embassies are very poor. You find very poor in Chinese institutions that allow for a learning process at the very micro level. No? But again, this is a fascinating topic uh, where we have been trying to integrate Chinese colleagues, students. I've been teaching summer courses in China uh, and I hope with some effect in the short and medium run. No? But welcome again and take this as an invitation to integrate to a very important topic, no? the very concrete learning within Chinese firms doing of the in Latin America and by the way, in the rest of the world. No? And by the way, I mean, from the beginning, you could probably say that you have a big heterogeneity. You, know? you have tens of thousands of firms from Huawei, which is probably pretty well prepared, from my, in my opinion, and two other firms that uh, still lack a basic understanding and are still looking for the public sector. Uh, in Mexico, like in China, they don't find it uh, and they uh, have a very difficult time. No? Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much to everybody for your interest. No, I see some faces that I know from different parts of Latin America. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, and to the Center for Latin America uh, studies and the University of Pittsburgh for allowing us to make this presentation. We are very uh, happy uh, to, uh, to, to socialize with you regarding this contribution. And I would simply uh, invite you to integrate to this uh, increasing in-depth uh, discussion on China's of the in Latin America uh, against, and to be very explicit, against this increasing autism that we witness in the academic, public, and, uh, uh, and private sectors, uh, and to a very rich topic that will be of an increasing importance in Latin America. And as I responded at the end, by the way, not only in Latin America, but of course also in China. You know? So this is an important topic with business organizations, the public sector, and academics, as we are doing with Uibe, Tsinghua, Reimin University, Peita, and the Institute for Latin America Studies of, of CAS in China. This is a topic which is very substantial in the near future. You know? So welcome to integrate yourself to this discussion. You know? And thank you. Thank you, Enrique. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, thank you all for your questions, for your participation. As always, we remain available um, should you have any additional suggestions. But uh, with that, I will just uh, conclude and, uh, and, and reiterate our appreciation for you taking part in this and you know, joining our virtual community as we are uh, all uh, in good, responsible uh, selves have to do. 
Thank you, Manuel, and sorry for the technical problems that were on my side and not on class side. No, thank you, Jessica, also. Have a good day and be yeah. healthy. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye.